Hi, and welcome to the AP Biology Lab 8 Population Genetics and Evolution uh, podcast. Uh, in this podcast, we do what's called the Hardy-Weinberg Lab. Uh, Hardy-Weinberg, remember, is a, a way to describe in, uh, in a population how the genes will change over time, or how the better way to say that is how they won't change. And so the reason I put a picture of Mr. Darwin here is that we can use Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to observe when evolution is actually taking place in a population. And so what we're dealing with is microevolution, in other words, changes within the gene frequencies in a, in a population. This graph is kind of confusing unless you really don't know what P and Q values are. And so P and Q values are going to be the frequency of the dominant and frequency of the recessive allele. And so as the number of big A, big A or homozygous dominant individuals, we'll say right here, increase up to a total of maybe a hundred percent of them you can see that the frequency of the other two phenotypes decrease um, so if you're really into that take a second to look at that if not we'll look to the next page so this is Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or Hardy-Weinberg equation is a better way to say that and so first of all we should kind of detail ourselves with what's down here in the middle p-value is going to be the allele frequency of the dominant and q is going to be the allele frequency of the recessive and so in this lab we'll use a cup we'll call it the mating chamber and inside there we're going to have beads and those beads will either be black and we'll say that's dominant or they're going to be white and we'll call that recessive and so if I put 50 beads of black and 50 beads of white in the cup what's my p-value? p-value is going to be 0.5 what's my q-value? q-value is also going to be 0.5 and so in this lab every time we start we always start with a p and a q-value equal to 0.5 or 50-50 half of each um, so what does the equation even tell us then? if we look at the equation itself p squared, if we take p squared, that's 0.5 times 0.5, which is 0.25, what that tells us is the frequency of homozygous dominant. In other words, if I shake this up, the odds of me pulling out two beads that are both black should be 0.25. In other words, there's a 25% chance. What about pulling out two whites? Well, that's also 0.25, or that's Q squared. And then what about the odds of me pulling out um, one that's heterozygous, either black, white, or white, black? Well, that's going to be a 50%. And so if I shake it up and pull two out, what are the odds that it's going to be black, white? It should be half of the time. Now, I can't look, and so if I pull those two out, I got black, black. What are the odds of that? Well, it'd be 25%. Let me try it again. Pull it out. Black, black. So that's pretty rare. Uh, what about that the next time? It's black, white. And so that should happen 50% of the time. Now that's an incredibly small sample size. And so in this lab, we have to make sure we pull a whole heck of a lot more than just three pairs. In fact, we pull 40 pairs out each time. And so what is equilibrium then? Well, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is more of a mathematical model, and it was come, it was uh, it was discovered by two different mathematicians at about the same time, Hardy and Weinberg. And this happens a lot in science. But what they said is if we keep these five things the same in a uh, population or in beads in a cup, in other words, if there's no mutation, the beads don't magically change to a different color. If there's no selection, I'm not drawing out ones of a specific color to get rid of. There's no gene flow. I'm not like adding new genes to the cup, and I'm not pulling genes out. If it's a large enough population size, and if we do random mating, in other words, I shake it up each time and I randomly pull it out, it should stay at 0.5 that whole time all the way across. And does it ever do that? No, not really. But look at this graph, which is pretty cool. Over here, what we have is a population where the n value is 20, the n value is 200, and the n value is 2000. And n is the number of individuals in that uh, population. And you can see that the bigger number we get, the closer it stays to that equilibrium. Um, and as we decrease the number, then it's just going to get random. In other words, uh, the law of large numbers says stats don't really work unless you have enough of them. And so what do we do in this lab? Well, the mating chamber is going to represent sex from generation to generation and so what we're doing is putting all our alleles inside here it makes it what's called the gene pool and then we're simply pulling them out and each of those one that pair that we pull out represents a new organism and that sets the next generation and so what are we studying in this lab we're studying four things first thing is just trying to hold Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium the same in other words, we're trying to make sure we have large sample, it's, it's random mating, no mutations, all of those five things are exactly the same. And we should see that those 0.5 values stay the same. In the next round, we do selection. What do we do there? If we pull out a black and a white, 
then we're okay. If we pull out a black and a black, we're okay. But if we pull out a white and a white, then that dies. So we could say it's a recessive disease, for example. We remove that, and then we calculate the next generation on that. And so I don't want to tell you what happens, so you'll have to figure it out. The next thing we model is heterozygote advantage. Uh, an example of that might be sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is an awful disease if you're homozygous recessive for it, but if you're heterozygous, you're actually protected against malaria. And so heterozygotes actually are protected, and so that's an advantage. And so we model that and see what happens to our uh, frequencies. And then finally, we do genetic drift. And so genetic drift is some kind of an event where we reduce the numbers from a large sample size to a smaller sample size. And then when we're done that with that, we figure out what happens. Uh, once we return that sample size uh, to a large number. And so those are the four things that we'll study in that. Um, and basically, we're trying to model what happens in a population uh, as far as genetics go. And uh, that's about it. And so hopefully that's helpful. And the end.